Good morning and welcome to Maysville. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad that you're here. And if you would, please take just a moment to fill out one of the blue visitor's cards, pass those towards the center aisle. In just a moment, we'll have the ushers come around and pick those up. The elders have asked me to announce that church services this evening will be canceled due to the inclement weather. So the possibility of the winter weather, we're going to go ahead and cancel the services this evening. Our sympathy is extended to Dorothy Dean and Marie Elkins in the death of their brother, Melvin Osborne, who passed away last week. His funeral services were on Monday. I have a card I'd like to read. Dear Maysville Church of Christ, thank you so much for the delicious fruit baskets you gave for us for Christmas. We very much appreciate you remembering us during the holiday season. We also appreciate all your prayers, cards, and well wishes. Thank you so much for all that you have done for us. This is from Rachel, David Coger, and Angie Kilpatrick. Anyone who has signed up for the Lads Puppets, please meet down front immediately after worship service and bring your parents with you. The January 30th, the monthly birthday and fellowship anniversary that we have at, uh, every last Sunday of the month, the theme this month is going to be the chili cook-off and the ice cream social. Service Team 2 will sponsor this activity. Tim Fairchild is looking for judges for this event. Also, the medical campaign in Cusco is going to be March 5th through March 12th, and they're looking for another, a doctor, three or four nurses, and another five to seven non-medical people to attend this activity. Of course, you'll be responsible for all your uh, transportation costs, and if you're interested in doing this, please see Steve Harless. Our opening song this morning is number 180, 180, the lesson this morning will be by Tim Orbison, our closing prayer by Tim Fairchild. We'll start this morning with the prayer by Charles Collins. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the blessings of life, especially for the opportunity that we're together this morning in the conference of this building and may we focus upon your word and draw strength from it as we go forward into the service. We thank you for the avenue of prayer. We thank you for listening to us, caring for us and loving us as you do, and especially for Jesus that you gave us, that we have that opportunity through him to enter into heaven when the time comes. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all things we thank you for this great country that we live in. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those that are out right now that are sacrificing their lives and their time that we can enjoy these freedoms and those that have gone on before us for their sacrifices. We thank you for just so much. Thank you for our health. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for those that are sick at this time for their comfort. Especially, Heavenly Father, for those that's lost loved ones recently, provide comfort for them, and may we support them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that again, that we'll focus upon you today, and we will, uh, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, to be remindful of Jesus when he suffered and died on the cross for our sins. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with those that's out working in the weather that's coming up on us, that you'll watch over them and provide them with safety. Pray that you'll go with us now, forgive us of our sins. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. One hundred eighty, let's everyone join in, please. <clears throat> Come, let us all unite to sing God is love. Let heaven and earth Yeah. 
hail to earth's remotest bound. God is love. In Christ we have redemption found. God is love. His blood is washed. And now we can rejoice to say that God is love. God is love. God is love. Come, let us all unite to sing that God. Portion here, God is love. His promises, our spirit share. God is Thirty-five, four hundred thirty-five. <clears throat> we take our minds back to the cross at this time, remembering the life that Jesus lived and his cruel death that he suffered on the cross, and then of course his resurrection that brings us life today because of the hope we have. It ought to draw us closer to God's love for us and also Christ's love for us. And let's sing the first and the last before we partake <clears throat> of his supper this morning. <clears throat> More love to thee, O Christ. More love to thee. Hear thou the prayer I make, O
Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for another day that we have uh, this morning to come and worship you. And we pray, Father, at, at this time during our worship that we will take we will take a moment to think about that bittersweet moment when your son died upon the cross. Bitter in the fact that he went to the cross and endured the pain, the nails through his hands and feet, the thorn, the thorns on his head, and the abuse to, to his back and body. But sweet in the fact that we understand that this sacrifice had to be done for us, and because of it that we have a hope to be with you one day. We pray now as we take of this bread that we may think about that body that was broken for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, we bow before you in this prayer of thanksgiving, and we thank you so much for the blessings of this opportunity to come together. We thank you so much for your son and sacrifice that he made on the cross. As we partake of this juice, which represents the blood that was shed on the cross, we pray that we can do so in a well-pleasing manner. In Jesus' name, amen.
number 924, 924. <clears throat> We're about to give back to God and some of what he's prospered us. Um, our giving oftentimes is a lot easier when we realize that we've already made a commitment giving ourselves to God because that should include all we possess as well. The New Testament <coughs> talks about different situations where congregations and people gave and it's remarked about some folks in there that they first gave themselves and then the giving was quite easy to those in need around them or possessions and our goods back to God. So uh, consider the fact this morning that if you've given yourself to God, then it's easy to give back cheerfully and uh, without any grudge this morning to sustain his work. We'll sing the first two stanza only, please. <clears throat> I am I no more. I am I no more. I've been born with blood, and I am Father in heaven, you're the great giver of every gift and every opportunity. And though we may not notice everything that you give us, from what we see, we know that we can never repay what's been given. We pray now that as we give the, these gifts, that you take these common things and use them to your holy purpose, and that every day that you help us to live gratefully and generously uh, we take the opportunity to think of every common task as a as an opportunity to serve your kingdom. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Three hundred fifty-six will be our song of invitation this morning. Three fifty-six, if you'd like to mark that hymn. I'd say this, even though we decided not to meet tonight, you might be glad to know we didn't say anything about Tim about preaching twice as long this morning. So, uh, did we, Emmett? I don't feel okay anyway. Three hundred ninety-six, we'll sing now. Three hundred ninety-six, <clears throat> we'll do the first and the last stanzas of this. 
And if you'd like to, please stand. We'll sing together. 396. <clears throat> And reach the masses, men of every birth. For an answer, Jesus gave a key. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw men unto me. Lift him up, lift him up. Still he speaks from eternity. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Lift him up by living as a Christian ought. Let the world and hear the Savior say, Lift him up, still he speaks from eternity. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Be seated, please. I guess great minds think alike. I'd already been trying to decide, how can I transition into my sermon for tonight when I get through with the one I'm planning for this morning? I probably should just leave that alone. Let's open up to Exodus chapter 5 and begin our discussion there. Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? What a great question. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? If you wanted to ask a question that had a modern day ring, we might put it in our own terminology like this. Who is God and so what? Would that summarize where Pharaoh was? And Moses and Aaron had brought their request. But Pharaoh wasn't impressed by this, by this request. He didn't know who God was. Didn't care. How many people live like that around us in our world? And if you talk to someone about going to church or worship or things that are right, or perhaps even in a Bible study, their response may be, what are you concerned about this stuff for? The old records of Scripture, and when I say that, I'm talking about those that, that take us back into the years even before the life of Abraham, I mean, the life of uh, uh, Moses. They take us back into the, into the deep B.C.'s, Abraham's life and Jacob's life and the people they were around. Polytheism was the norm. Many gods. They worshipped many gods. All kinds. There's several examples I'd like to call your attention to. For example, in Genesis chapter 31, Jacob has gone to live with, uh, with a man, actually who is kinfolk, an uncle, 
Laban. There he meets one of his cousins. It was done back then. Falls in love with her. They marry. And as it becomes time for them to leave, Jacob has to sneak away to get away. And in the process of doing so, Rachel, his wife, takes the household gods that belong to Laban. He took or she took his idols. They had idols that they worshipped. Who were they? What were the idols of? We don't have explanation of that. But they were involved in idolatry. A little farther. Book of Exodus chapter 32. Here the children of Israel have been in Egypt. They've come out of Egypt. They're beginning their uh, service to God. God calls them to Mount Sinai while Moses is up on the mountain. Aaron is down with the people. And Moses has been gone a good long while, and the people say, we, what happened to this Moses guy? He's gone. Aaron, you do something for us. Make us a God that we can worship. We're out here by ourselves, and we're alone. Aaron calls for them to get off the gold jewelry that they're wearing. He takes it, fashions it into a golden calf, presents it back to the children of Israel, and says, Here is your God brought you up out of Egypt. Joshua chapter 24 verse 2. We have this reading. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, lived on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. The Lord was talking to Joshua, telling them about their history. And it says, there's idolatry around you. It's everywhere. Listen to this list. The book of Judges, chapter 10, verse 6. Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the, the Baals, the Baals, the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. Now that goes back 1,500 years B.C. When I was in school, back a ways, we studied Roman and Greek mythology. And in talking about the Romans and the Greeks, one of the things that was discussed was the, the gods that they worshipped. And many of you are aware of, of Jupiter, and Mercury, they're not just planet names. These were the names of the Roman gods, their deities. The Greek gods, Zeus, Athena, Venus, others in that list could be described. These, Aphrodite, uh, these were the, the idols that they worshipped. Now, with that setting of the, of the commonness of idolatry, when we move into the New Testament and we find ourselves in the book of Acts, chapter 17, we have the setup then for a discussion of gods. Let's begin in Acts chapter, six, uh, Acts chapter 17 with verse 16 and read for a few verses. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, encountered him and said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, 
I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through with, through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And let's stop our reading there for a moment. Paul says he is going to proclaim to them a God and then makes a series of statements concerning this God. And first, he says, God made the world and everything in it. There's a little song I'll bet you know. Louis Armstrong was famous for it. And some of the words of the song go, I see trees of green, red roses too, skies of blue, clouds of white, bright blessed days, dark sacred nights. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Chances are, as you go through your life every day, you give very little attention to where you are. Most of us are so caught up in the busyness of life. We get up in the morning with a schedule, and there may be a number of things that we have to accomplish in the day, and so we we begin to rush about our activities. We go off to work, have our meetings, accomplish a variety of tasks. We may end up home later in the day, tired, or maybe take in some entertainment, do a few projects around the house, back to bed, cycle again. And never really think about where you are. You remember your high school geology? What the earth is, what it's made of? It would be an interesting experience if we could somehow strip away all that is around us and have the ability to see the earth from a distance, take it apart. According to scientists, The Earth's crust that we live on is about 100 miles thick. To give you some perspective, that's relatively the same as a drive from here to Nashville. If you were to drive from here straight down into the Earth, about 100 miles, you'd run out of dirt and rock. That's about how thick the Earth's crust is. Once you penetrate the Earth's crust, <coughs> Then you start getting into some other stuff. The deepest well that has ever been drilled on the face of the earth went down about eight miles, 40, a little less than 41,000 feet. The temperature at the bottom of that hole, when they pulled that drill, drill dim out and decided not to drill anymore was 356 degrees. That's eight miles down. They had hoped to go down to 49,000 feet in drilling, but they estimated, considering the change in the temperature as they went down, that by the time they got to 49,000 feet, that the hole, the bottom hole temperature was going to be almost 600 degrees.
and they knew that the metal that they were using, the drill pipe, the drill stem, and the drill head, was not going to be capable of doing the work it needed to do at that temperature. The metal itself is starting to get soft. It can no longer cut through the rock because it's just too hot. And that's only a tiny, tiny part of just the surface. The crust, we are told, rests on a, a mantle which begins to be, for all practical purposes, liquid rock. It is so hot that the rock is dissolved. The top of that layer is somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,200 degrees, and by the time you get to the bottom of that, that mantle, you're at 2,500 degrees temperature. After we get through the mantle, we get to a place that they describe as the core. And we could be more technical than this, and I know I'm overgeneralizing. And scientists only assume that this is what's taking place inside because of some measurements of sonic waves and extrapolations of the magnetic sphere around us and things of this sort because we can't look inside. But from the imagery that can be obtained by bouncing sound waves through the earth and measuring them as they come through in different places, these are the, the projections that they have. That beginning about, uh, oh, 3,000 miles in, we run into this core, which on the outside of it is some, is liquid metal. It's, it's iron. It's melted iron and nickel. And then we come to the middle core, the, the inner core, which is under so much pressure, and even though it is nearly 7,000 degrees in temperature, it is, it's not liquid. It's not melted. It is solid. I don't know that I understand that, but the description of it from scientists is that if you take that metal, even though it is that hot, and put enough pressure on it, it can no longer stay in a liquid state, but it goes back to a solid state again. How did that come to be exactly? Vapors, clouds of dust that accumulated. God who made the world. To give you an, an idea of that thickness of the earth and are drilling into it. If we took two stacks of paper, a ream of paper, copy papers, about 500 sheets and a couple inches thick, put two reams together, that'd be about a uh, thousand sheets of paper, and assume that every one of those sheets of paper is approximately eight miles. A thousand sheets of paper would be about 8,000 miles, and that's the width of the earth. Take off one sheet of paper, and that one sheet of paper would represent the deepest well hole that's ever been drilled on the face of the earth. And you got that left. Our world around us is, is unbelievable. If we were to then to talk about all of the water and the water systems and that three-fourths of our planet is covered in water and that it affects everything around us, it regulates our temperature, it affects our life, there could be no life without this water, no other known planet or body anywhere has it, water. We talk about air. The air you breathe without even taking a thought. It's chemical composition. It's ability to refresh you, to sustain you, to provide the essence of life. If we go swimming, we have to take air with us. If we go up into, into the flying into the heavens or in outer space, we have to take air with us. We have to keep our temperature very carefully regulated. And all of life around us? Acts chapter 14, verse 15 says, The living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. 
Paul began with this group, and he says, let me tell you where we begin. We begin by saying God created these things. That's our God. And he doesn't live in temples made with hands. That's point number two. <coughs> Paul is surrounded by the temples of Corinth or in Athens. He's there with, with all of the, uh, uh, the Acropolis and, and the, the, the hill from where he is, or the little rock from where he is speaking. The view of the temples behind him <laughs> cannot be mistaken. And they are magnificent structures. If you've ever been over to Athens, Greece, it will forever be a picture in your mind that you won't be able to turn loose of because of its dramatic beauty, its starkness, and looking at these great uh, buildings that are built on the mountains. And he says, God doesn't live in these God who created all of the world cannot live in a temple made by hands. He created this. As though he had some need of something. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor, verse 25, is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives life to all, breath, and all things. How do we worship God? I'm not sure about the specific people whom Paul was talking about at that time, but if we go back very far in history, what we find is that the people who lived believed that the sacrifices that they were offering were feeding the gods. That they got together and they offered the animals and they offered the, uh, the, the blood sacrifices and the different things that they were poured out. And that these were providing food for the gods. In fact, there are even some, some stories where uh, the gods are uh, described as, as going hungry because uh, the people quit worshiping them. Quit offering up their sacrifices. Let's read from Psalm chapter 50. Verse 7 is where I'll start. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. Now verse 10. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. God's declaration to Israel is, I don't need anything from you. When you offer these sacrifices to me, you're not feeding me, I'm not going hungry without them, you're not serving in some way as though I had some need from you. I'm not going to take your animals, the, the uh, animals that are in your flock. I'm not going to take something out of your herd. I'm not going to get these things, and you're not offering me sacrifices so that uh, I, I won't take your stuff. I don't need your stuff. He said, if I wanted stuff, I've got a thousand hills full of cattle. Every beast that's out there, I could take if I wanted it. I know every living thing. I know all of the birds, even those that dwell in the mountains. And then he goes on, verse 12. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. For the world is mine in all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. God says you don't understand the relationship that we've got. The things that are going on and the sacrifices that I've required of you, it's not for my benefit, it's for yours. 
It's for you to recognize and give thanks back that you are providing something back to God because God has provided for you. It is your recognition of dependence. You are not giving to me. I'm not hungry. And you can't serve me. And there's nothing we can do. Think about it for a moment. What can you do for God? No, honestly, think about that. What is it that you could possibly do to provide any kind of thing for God's life? We who are finite, we who are trapped here on the surface of this earth, we can live a little bit below it. We can move just slightly above it, but only for a very brief time. Our lives are so fragile. Our abilities are so meager. All of the things that we will create on this world, they will all go back to dust within just a, a few dozen or a few hundred years. Very few things that man has ever touched sustains itself for very many generations. The one exception might be where we have brought together piles of rock, the pyramids or other things of that sort. God is not worshipped by our hands, by the things that we can create. God is not taken care of by what we can do for him. Back to our text. Let's continue our reading. Verse 26. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. Made from one blood every nation some translations say made from one ancestor or made from one man the text literally says made from one blood that's a good translation by the new king james version the meaning of it surely is the concept that that we're all the same we've all been brought from the same source to live when we look around the world, that we see those who live in different continents, and there's always been a tendency for people to um, look at other nations and other peoples and think of themselves, we're better than you are. The Assyrians did. The Assyrians lived and they conquered other lands because they were better than everyone else. The Babylonians then conquered the Assyrians, and the Babylonians went through the same experience. We're better than everyone else. And after the Babylonians, the Medes and Persians conquered everybody else, and they said, we're better than you are. And after the Medes and the Persians, then we have the Greeks come along, and the Greeks conquered the world, and they said, we're the best. And the Romans conquered the world. Then Rome fell. And in our lifetime in general, the Germans came along and said, we're the best and we will conquer the world. There have always been those who said, we're different than you are. We're better than you. And look down at some other nation. And we may do the same thing today. We may look at those who live in other parts of the world and think that we're better than them. We're Americans. Or we're white, Caucasians. I'm better than, and we might put our spot at the top and say, I'm better than that group of people. I'm better than that eth ethnic race. I'm better than this, I'm whatever. That's not what Paul said. Paul said we're from one blood. God made us. We're his. We're all the same. And he has made us from one blood in every nation to dwell on the face of the earth. Verse 27, for what purpose? There's one question left that we haven't asked. Paul's given this list of qualifications, or this list of qualities, this list of actions that God has done, but we have this question. Why? Why, why did God make the earth? Why did God give us the things that we have? Why can't we do anything for him? What is the purpose for all of this? And he explains in verse 27. So that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him 
and find him. God made us to seek him. In the history of every culture, every people that's ever been discovered on the, the planet Earth, there's a history of some sort of religious beliefs, some seeking after a God, a supernatural being. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, God has put eternity in our hearts. We have an in a hardwired desire to find out about who we are and where we've come from and how we've gotten here and where we're going and what's our purpose. To find God. Most women long for babies. Why? They're made for that function. Women can give birth to babies. Most men are driven to test themselves. We test ourselves with sports, with adventure, with, uh, with mountain peaks. We want to be the first one to climb that hill, that rock. Why? You've seen the t-shirts. Because it's there. That's why. Why do men fight each other? Even in our games, we fight each other. Some of you probably sat down and watched some of those mock warrior games this weekend. And it was done with sometimes little round balls and sometimes oblong balls and sometimes little bitty balls we hit with sticks. And we compete to see who can hit that ball the farthest or throw that ball the right way or run with that ball and get across that line. Why do we compete like that? Challenge ourselves. We're made that way. We're made to seek God. I said Wednesday night, and let me just put in a 30-second commercial. We just started this last Wednesday night in the auditorium a study of the book of Ecclesiastes, which is probably one of the most deeply philosophical books in all of Scripture which asks some of the really hard questions about life. Who am I? Why am I here? What am I going to do with myself? And I made a comment Wednesday night that I'm going to follow up on many times, that we have a God-sized hole in our hearts that we're looking to fill. And people will try to fill it with all kinds of things. They'll try to fill it with sexuality. They'll try to fill it with money. They'll try to fill it with possessions. They'll try to fill it with ambition. They'll try to fill it with all kinds of things because there's a longing, there's a need, there's a hunger inside of us that we just can't quite get filled. What we're looking for in real fulfillment is God. The reason for who we are and why we are and where we're going. And then Paul says, not only are we looking for God, but we seek the Lord and hope that we might find him. Then he says, but he's not very far from us. It's a wonderful thing to go back to the Old Testament and then into the New and find the places where God interacted with people. Genesis chapter 16 and then again in chapter 21, a woman, a, a, a no one, a a servant that belonged to Abraham named Hagar. God sends a messenger to care for her, to have a conversation with her. God saw her, knew her. There's a man traveling in Acts chapter 8, and the Holy Spirit pulls Philip out of a city full of people who want to hear about Jesus and says, go out in the desert. He goes out in the desert, and then uh, Philip, we don't know how long he was in the desert, but then along comes this, this caravan, this, this chariot, and the Holy Spirit says, go attach yourself to that chariot. Okay. Goes up to the chariot, and when he comes up, there's a man sitting in that chariot, and he's reading from the scroll of Isaiah. He's seeking God. He lives in Ethiopia. 
down in, in Africa. He's traveled up to Israel to worship God, and now he's on his way back home, and he's reading the scriptures, and he's wanting to know, who is this God? What, what's going on here? And God has sent somebody to him. You know the rest of that story, the beautiful story in Acts 8, where Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I understand this? I don't have anybody to explain it to me. Come up and tell me what it means. Philip climbs into the chariot with the Ethiopian and tells him about Jesus. When he come to the water, the Ethiopian has now been taught about Jesus and taught about God and taught about sacrifices and taught about obedience and all of the other things that are necessary in order to serve God. How do we know that? Because when they come to water, the Ethiopian says, Look, here's water. Why can't I be baptized? Baptism is a part of the preaching of Jesus Christ. We know that by what Jesus told his disciples to do. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism was a part of that message. So that we know that when Philip went up into the chariot with the Ethiopian, this man from nowhere... God was near him. Acts chapter 10, we meet Cornelius in the city of Caesarea. He's a nobody. He's a Roman soldier. God sends an angel to him and says, I've been listening to your prayers. Send for a guy named Peter down here at this house in this town, and he'll come up and tell you words that you need to hear in order to be saved. Why are those stories in Scripture? They're there to tell us that God is near us. That He is watching us. That He is listening to us. In hopes that we will find Him. And the message of Jesus Christ spread out across these pages and now spilled across the whole world to be taught to all humanity. Not with idolatry are we going to serve the Lord. I'd love to go and read from Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah talks about the people who come and make the idols. He says, well, you come and get a tree and you chop it up and you, you carve something out of it. And you say, here's my God. You've got to carry him around. He can't walk. He can't see. He can't move. He can't do anything for you, good or bad. You made him. Jeremiah chapter 10, Jeremiah says you, you come up and you, you get this thing and you, you make it, you build it, you decorate it, then you bow down to it, and then you call on it to help you. How foolish are you? That's not a God. But then Paul has one more thought to talk about the real God. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, verse 29, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art, man's devising. Verse 30, truly those times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. By the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance to all of this by raising him from the dead. You don't worship God with a temple. You don't worship God by offering sacrifices. You worship God by changing how you live your life. Repentance. Luke chapter 24, verse 47. Jesus said that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in all nations beginning in Jerusalem. That's what you go and tell people. Change your ways. Change your life. That's how we serve God. There are lots of religious folks who like to talk about belief. Belief, yeah, believe in God. Oh, yeah, I'd like to talk about belief. They are happy to talk about confession. Oh, I'll confess Jesus. They may not be as interested to talk about repentance. Uh, repentance, what do you mean by repentance? That means you have to change. You have to do something different than the way you've been doing it before. I don't know about that. but now commands all men everywhere to repent. In fact, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5, except you repent, you'll 
all perish. And then baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Have you found God? These men in Athens, they were very religious. They had all kinds of beliefs. But they didn't know the real God. They didn't know the God who created the world and all things. They didn't know the God who had power. The God who would bring them into judgment. The God who had the ability to give them eternal life. They didn't know the God who had brought Jesus into the world. At least they didn't know him yet. But Paul did what God wanted done, which was to preach the gospel to every creature. We have heard that message now. We have heard the testimony of God concerning himself, concerning his son. And we must make a choice with our lives. Whether or not we will change by repentance and follow after God, confessing our faith in Christ, we can be baptized for the remission of sins, become a part of his family. Or we can choose to go another way. Until the time comes for judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after that the judgment. When you stand before God in judgment. And you give an account to him. What will you say? Well you know I really didn't believe you were real. Or will you say well you know I heard about you. I knew you were out there. But I really didn't like the stuff you said. Or will you say, my Lord and my God, that choice is yours. A decision you make now will affect a decision God will make later. What decision will you make now? If you're not a child of God, until you die, I suppose you have time. But the opportunities for life and for making that choice may not come as often as you like. And you're not in control of your future. Someday you will stand before God. Be ready on that day. If you're not a Christian, you can this morning change that by the confession of your faith in Jesus and being baptized for the mission of sins. You can become a part of his family. If you need to come home, either because you've never been to God's home or because you need to return, the invitation is for you. If we can assist you, come as we stand and sing. is calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today, bring him thy burden and thou shalt be blessed, he will not turn thee away, calling today. is pleading all oh, this to his voice him today him today they believe on his name shall rejoice quickly arise and away calling today is calling is tenderly calling today <clears throat> Tim thank you very much appreciate the lesson 523 will be our closing hymn 523 we'll have our prayer after the first and last stanza of that please <clears throat>
mention also the lads class for speech we're starting that Wednesday night we're planning that I want to mention that again and I guess I'd encourage you this evening since we won't be planning to assemble together to uh, maybe take time out for a little extra reading at home prayer maybe a devotional of some kind it may, may do us all good to do that as well privately more we'll sing the first and last stanza again <clears throat> There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tilled the skies with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with his great might. There is a God, he is alive, in him we Survive from dust our good created man. He is our good, the great I am. Our God, he sat upon a tree. A life was willing there to give that he from sin might set man free and evermore <coughs> live. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live, and we survive from dust our good created man. He is our God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for this service, for the word and the teaching that was delivered to us. We pray that those words and that your guidance will go into our hearts and that we'll be examples for others and that we'll have an opportunity to help someone else throughout this week. We pray that you'll bless us as we go on our way today. Bless those who have to travel in this weather. We say a special prayer for our first responders, the paramedics, the firemen, the policemen who have to brave the environment and the harsh weather to go out and help people in need. We pray that you'll protect them and watch over them, encourage their families. We pray that you'll watch over our leaders and that you'll bless them with knowledge and wisdom and that they'll make decisions based on your word. And we pray that you'll uh, continue to watch over us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.